The ship came down from space. It came from the stars and the black velocities and the shining movements and the silent gulfs of space. It was a new ship. It had fire in its body and men in its metal cells. And it moved with a clean silence, fiery and warm. And in it were 17 men, including a captain. And the crowd at the Ohio field had shouted and waved their hands up into the sunlight. And the rocket had bloomed out. Very great flowers of heat and color. And ran away into space on the third voyage to Mars. Now, it was decelerating with metal efficiency in the upper Martian atmosphere. It was still a thing of beauty and strength. It had moved in the midnight waters of space like a pale sea leviathan. And it passed the ancient moon and thrown itself onward into one nothingness following another. The men within it had been battered, thrown about, sickened, made well again each in his turn. One man had died, but now the remaining sixteen with their eyes clear in their heads and their faces pressed to the thick glass ports watched Mars swing up under them. Mars, good old Mars, here we are, cried Navigator Lustig. Good old Mars, said Samuel Hingston, the archaeologist. Yeah, well, said Captain Black. The ship landed softly on a lawn of green grass. And outside, upon the lawn, stood an iron deer. And further up the lawn, a tall brown Victorian house sat in the quiet sunlight all covered with scrolls and rococo. Its windows made of blue and pink and yellow and green colored glass. Upon the porch were hairy geraniums and an old swing which was hooked into the porch ceiling and which now swung back and forth, back and forth, in a light breeze. And at the top of the house was a cupola of diamonds, leaded glass windows, and a dunce cap roof. Though the front windows could not be seen through, there was the sound of an ancient piano. It sounded like yellow keys and a piece of music titled Beautiful Ohio sitting on the music rest. And around the rocket in four directions spread the little town, green and motionless in the Martian spring. There were white houses and red bricks and tall elm trees blowing in the wind and tall maples and horse chestnuts and church steeples with golden bells silent in them. And the men in the rocket looked out and saw this. Then they looked at one another and they looked out again. They held on to each other's elbows, suddenly unable to breathe, it seemed. And their faces grew pale, and they blinked constantly, running from glass port to glass port of the ship. How be, whispered Lustig, rubbing his face with his numb fingers, his eyes wet. How be? It it can't be. It just can't be, said Samuel Hingston. Lord, said Captain John Black. There was a call for the chemist. Well, sir, the atmosphere's fine for breathing, sir. Black turned slowly. Are you sure? No doubt of it, sir. Well, then we'll go out, said Lustig. Lord, yes, said Samuel Hingston. Hold on, said Captain John Black. Just a moment. Nobody gave any orders. But sir, sir, nothing. How do we know what this is? We know what it is, sir, said the chemist. It's a small town. Looks like it has good air in it. And the small town, the like of earth towns, said Samuel Hingston, the archaeologist. Incredible. It can't be, but... It is. Do you think that the civilization of two planets can progress at the same rate and evolve in the same way, Hingston? 
I, I wouldn't have thought so, sir. Uh, but look out there. Geraniums. A specialized plant. That specific variety has only been known on Earth for 500 years. Think of the thousands of years it takes to evolve plants. Then tell me if it's logical that the Martians should have one. One. Glass windows. Two. Capolas. Three. Porch swings. Four. An instrument that looks like a piano and probably is a piano. And five. If you look closely, if a Martian composer would have published a piece of music titled, strangely enough, Beautiful Ohio. All of which means that we have an Ohio River here on Mars. It is quite strange, sir. Strange. <laughs> it's absolutely impossible. And I suspect the whole bloody shooting setup. Something's wrong here, and I'm not leaving the ship until I know what it is. Oh, sir. Darn it. Sir, I want to investigate this at first hand. It may be that there are similar patterns of thought, movement, civilization on every planet in our system. We may be on the threshold of the great psychological and metaphysical discovery in our time. Sir, what do you think? I think I'm willing to wait a moment. It may be, sir, that we are looking upon a phenomenon that for the first time would absolutely prove the existence of a god, sir. Yeah. There are many people who are of good faith without such proof, Mr. Hankston. I'm one myself, sir, but certainly a thing like this out there, out here, could not occur without divine intervention, sir. It fills me with such an elation, I don't know whether to laugh or cry, sir. Yeah, do neither then until we know what we're up against. Up against? Sir, I see that we're up against nothing. It's, it's a good, quiet, green town, much like the one I was born in, and I like the look of it. Yeah, where were you born, Lustig? I was born in 1910. That makes you 50 now, doesn't it? Well, this being 1960, yes, sir. And you, Hankston? 1920, sir, in Illinois. And this looks swell to me, sir. This couldn't be heaven. Though I must admit, it looks peaceful and cool. Pretty much like Green Bluff, where I was born in 1915. He looked at the chemist. And the air's all right, is it? Y yes, sir. Well then, tell you what we'll do. Lustig, you, and Hinkston, and I. We'll fetch ourselves out to look this town over. The other 14 men will stay aboard this ship, and if anything untoward happens, lift the ship and get out. Do you hear what I say, Craner? Yes, sir. Out we'll go, sir, leaving you. Yeah, a loss of three men's better than a whole ship. If something bad happens, get back to Earth and warn the next rocket. That's Lingle's rocket, I think which will be completed and ready to take off sometime around next Christmas. What he has to meet up with, if there's something hostile about Mars, we certainly want the next expedition to be well armed. So we are, sir. We've got a regular arsenal with us. Tell the men to stand by the guns. Then, as Lustig and Hinkston and I go out, Lustig, Hinkston, come along. The three men walked together, down, through the levels of the ship, and it was a beautiful spring day on Mars. 
A robin sat on a blossoming apple tree and sang continuously. Showers of petal snow sifted down when the wind touched the apple tree and the blossom smell drifted upon the air. And somewhere in the town, somebody was playing the piano. And the music came and went and came and went softly, drowsily. And the song was Beautiful Dreamer. And somewhere else, a phonograph, scratchy and faded, was hissing out a record of Roman and Gloman, sung by Harry Lauder. Three men stood outside the ship. The port closed behind them. At every window, a face pressed, looking out, and the large metal guns pointed this way and that ready. Now the phonograph record being played was, Oh, give me a June night, the moonlight, and you. And Lustig began to tremble, and Samuel Hinkston did likewise. And Hinkston's voice was so feeble and uneven that the captain had to ask him to repeat what he had said. I said, Sir, that I think I have solved this. All of this, sir. And what's the solution, Hinkston? A soft wind blew, the sky was serene and quiet, and somewhere a stream of water ran through the cool caverns and tree shadings of a ravine. And somewhere a horse and wagon trotted and rolled by bumping. Sir, it must be. It has to be. And this is the only solution. Rocket travel began to Mars in the years before the First World War. Sir, no. But yes, sir, you must admit, look at all of this. How else explain the houses, the lawns, the iron deer, the flowers, the pianos, the music. Hingston. <sighs> and the captain put his hand to his face, shaking his head, his hand shaking now, his lips blue. Sir, listen to me. Say there were some people in the year 1905, perhaps who hated wars and wanted to get away from Earth, and they got together, some scientists in secret, and built a rocket and came out here, to Mars. No, Hingston. I mean, why not? The world was a different place in 1905. They could have kept a secret much more easily. But the work, Hingston, the work of building a complex thing like a rocket? No. No. The captain looked at his shoes, looked at his hands, looked at the houses, and then at Hingston. And they came back here. And naturally, the houses they built were similar to earth houses because they brought the cultural architecture with them. And here it is. And they've lived here. Here, all these years. In peace and quiet, sir, yes. Maybe they made a few trips to bring enough people here for one small town and then stopped. For fear of being discovered. That's why the town seems so old-fashioned. I don't see a thing myself that's older than the year 1927, do you? Yeah, frankly I don't, Hingston. These are our people, sir. This is an American city. It's definitely not European. Yeah, that's right too, Hingston. Or maybe... Just maybe, sir, rocket travel is older than we think. Perhaps it started in some part of the world hundreds of years ago and was discovered and kept secret by a small number of men and they came to Mars with only occasional visits to Earth over the centuries. You make it almost sound reasonable. It is, sir. It has to be. We have the proof here before us. All we have to do now is find some people and verify it. Well, you're right there, of course. We can't just stand here and talk. You brought your gun? Yes, but I don't think we'll need it. Yeah, we'll see about it. Come along. We'll ring that doorbell and see if anyone is home. And their boots were deadened of all sound in the thick green grass. Smelling the fresh mowing, in spite of himself, Captain John Black felt a great peace come over him. 
It had been 30 years since he had been in a small town, and the buzzing of spring bees on the air lulled and quieted him, and the fresh look of things was a balm to the soul. Hollow echoes sounded from under the boards as they walked up the porch and stood before the screen door, and inside they could see a head curtain hung across the hall entry, and a crystal chandelier and a parish painting framed on one wall over a comfortable moor's chair. And the house smelled old and of the attic and infinitely comfortable. You could hear the tinkle of ice rattling in the lemonade pitcher. In a distant kitchen, because of the heat of the day, someone was preparing a soft lemon drink. Captain John Black rang the bell. Footsteps, dainty and thin, came along the hall and a kind-faced lady of some forty years, dressed in the sort of dress you might expect in the year 1909, peered out. Can I help you? Beg your pardon, but we're looking for, that is, could you help us, uh, I mean, uh, if you're selling something, I'm much too busy and I haven't the time. Uh, no. Uh, what town is this? What do you mean, what town is it? How could you be in a town and not know what town it was? Uh, I beg your pardon, uh, but we're strangers here. We're from Earth, and we want to know how this town got here. How you got here. Are you a census taker? No. What do you want then? Well, uh, well, uh, how long has this town been here? It was built in 1868. Is this a game? No, it's a, it's not a game. Uh, Look here, we're from Earth. From where? From Earth. Where's that? From Earth. Oh, out of the ground, you mean? From the planet Earth. Here, come out on the porch and I'll show you. I won't come out there. You're all evidently quite mad from the sun. Miss, Hingston said. We came in a flying spaceship across space, among the stars. And we came from the third planet from the sun, Earth, to this planet, which is Mars. Do you understand, Miss Mad from the sun? Go away now, before I call my husband, who's upstairs taking a nap. And he'll beat you all with his fists. But this is Mars, is it is it not? This is Green Lake, Wisconsin, on the continent of America, surrounded by the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, on a place called the world, or sometimes the Earth. Go away now. Goodbye. She slammed the door. The three men stood before the door with their hands up in the air, as if pleading with her to open it once more. They looked at one another. Let's knock the door down, said Lustig. Yeah, we can't. Why not? She didn't do anything bad, did she? We're the strangers here. This is private property. Good God. Hingston! He went and sat down on the porch step. What, sir? Did it ever strike you that maybe we got ourselves somehow, some way fouled up and by accident came back and landed on Earth? Oh, sir, sir, how could we have done that? I don't know, just let me think, but... We checked every mile of the way and we saw Mars on our chronometer. It said so many miles gone, we went past the moon, out into space, and here we are, on Mars. I'm sure we're on Mars, sure. But suppose, just suppose that by accident, in space, and time or something, We landed on a planet in space, in another time. Suppose this is Earth, 30 or 50 years ago. Maybe we got lost in the dimensions. Do 
do you think? Uh, go away, Lustig. Are the men in the ship keeping an eye on us, Hingston? At their guns, sir. Lustig went to the door, rang the doorbell, and when the door opened again, he asked, What year is this? <gasps> 1926, of course. Hey, boys, did you hear that? She said 1926. We have gone back in time. This is Earth. Lustig sat down, and the three men let the wonder and terror of thought afflict them. Their hands stirred fitfully on their knees, and the wind blew, nodding the locks of hair on their heads. Uh, I never thought it would be like this. It scares the hell out of me. How can things like this even happen? Will anybody in the whole town believe us? Are we playing around with something dangerous? Time, I mean. Shouldn't we just take off and go home? No, we'll try another house. I like to be as logical as I can get in these situations. That's it. How does this sound to you, Hingston? Suppose, as you said originally, the rocket traveled backwards years ago. And when the Earth people had lived here a number of years, they began to get homesick for Earth. First a mild neurosis about it, then a full-fledged psychosis. Threatened insanity. And what would you do as a psychiatrist if faced with such a problem? Well, I think I'd rearrange the civilizations on Mars so it resembled Earth more and more. Each day. And if there was a way of reproducing every plant, every road, every lake, and every ocean, I would do so. Then I would, by some vast crowd hypnosis, theoretically anyway, convince everyone in a town this size that this really was Earth, not Mars at all. Good enough, Hankson. I think we're on the right track now. That woman in that house back there just thinks she's living on Earth. It protects her. She and all the others in this town are the patients of the greatest experiment in migration and hypnosis you will ever lay your eyes on in your life. That's it, sir, cried Lustig. Well, now we're getting somewhere, and I feel better. It all sounds a bit more logical. Well, it looks like we'll be fairly welcome here. We have superior weapons if... They should try to kill us, and anyway, all we can do is try. The next house now. Up we go. But they had hardly crossed the lawn when Lustig stopped and looked across the lawn down the quiet, dreaming afternoon street. Sir, he said. What is it, Lustig? Asked the captain. Oh, sir. Sir, what I see, what I do see now before me, oh. Oh, said Lustig, and he began to cry. His fingers came up, twisting and trembling, and his face was all wonder and joy and incredulity. He sounded as if any moment he might go insane from happiness. He looked down the street, and he began to run, stumbling, awkwardly, falling, picking himself up and running on. Oh, God! Thank you, God, thank you. Uh, don't let him get away. The captain broke into a run, and now Lustig was running at full speed and shouting. He turned into a yard halfway across a little shady side street and leaped up onto the porch of a large greenhouse with an iron rooster on the roof. He was beating upon the door, shouting, and hollering, and crying when Hingston and the captain ran up and stood in the yard. The door opened, and Lustig yanked the screen wide, and a high wail of discovery and happiness cried out, Grandma! Grandpa! And two old people stood in the doorway, their faces lighting up. Albert? Their voices piped, and they rushed out to embrace and pat him on the back. Albert! Oh! It's been... So many years. You're grown, boy. How big you are. Oh, Albert, boy, how are you? Grandma. Grandpa. 
It's good to see you. I look fine. Oh, fine. And he held them, turned them, kissed them, hugged them, cried on them. Held them out again and blinked at the little old people. And the sun was in the sky and the wind blew and the grass was green. And the screen door stood open. Come on in. There's lemonade for you. Fresh. Lots of it. Grandma. Grandpa. So good to see you. I've, I, I've got friends down here. Here. Lustig turned and waved wildly at the captain and Hingston, who all during the adventure on the porch had stood in the shade of a tree, holding on to each other. Captain, come up, come up. I want you to meet my grandfolks. Howdy. Any friend of Albert's is ours, too. Don't stand there with your mouths open. Come on. In the living room of the house, it was cold. And a grandfather clock ticked high and low and bronzed in one corner. There was a soft pillow and a large couch and walls filled with books and a rug cut in a thick rose pattern. And Annie mascaras pinned the furniture and lemonade in the hand, sweating and cool on the thirsty tongue. Here's to our health. How long have you been here, Grandma? Oh, a good many years. Ever since we died. Ever since you what? Asked Captain John Black, putting his drink down. Oh, oh, yes. Uh, th th they've been dead for 30 years. And you're just sitting there. Calmly. Oh, tush, said the old woman, and winked glitteringly at John Black. Who are we to question what happens? And here we are. What's live, anyway? Who does what for why and where? All we know is here we are, alive again. And no questions asked, a second chance. She toddled over and out her thin wrist to Captain John Black. Feel solid, aren't I? You hear my voice, don't you? Well then, why go around questioning? Well, it's simply that we never thought we'd find a thing like this on Mars. And now you've found it. I, I dare say there's lots on every planet that'll show you God's infinite ways. Is this heaven? asked Tankston. Oh, nonsense, no. It's a world. We get a second chance. Nobody told us why, and then nobody told us why we were on Earth, either. That other Earth, I mean, the one you came from. How do we know there wasn't another Earth before that one? Eh, that's a good question. The captain stood up and slapped his hand on his leg in an offhand fashion. Anyway, we've got to be going. It's been nice. Thank you for the drinks. And he stopped. He turned and looked toward the door, startled. Far away in the sunlight, there was a sound of voices, a crowd, a snouting and great hello. What's that? asked Hingston. Well, we're about to find out said Captain John Blank. Joltingly, across the green lawn and into the street of the Martian town, he stood looking at the ship. The ports were open, and his crew were streaming out, waving their hands. A crowd of people had gathered. In and through, among these people, the members of the crew were running, talking, laughing, shaking hands. People did little dances, people swarmed, the rocket lay empty and abandoned, and a brass band exploded in the sunlight. Flinging off a tune from upraised tubas and trumpets, there was a bang of drums and a shrill of fifes. Little girls with golden hair jumped up and down, and little boys shouted hooray. And fat men passed around ten-cent cigars. The mayor of the town made a speech. 
Then each member of the crew, with mother on one arm, a father or sister on the other, was spirited off down the street, into little cottages or big mansions, and doors slammed shut. The wind rose in the clear spring sky, and all was suddenly silent. The brass band had banged off around the corner, leaving the rocket to shine, dazzle alone in the sunlight. Abandoned. <laughs> Abandoned the ship, they did. I'll have their skins. They had orders. Sir, don't be too hard on them. Those were all old relatives and friends. That's no excuse. Think how they felt, Captain. Seeing familiar faces outside the ship. I would have obeyed orders. I would have... And the captain's mouth remained open, striding along the sidewalk under the Martian sun, tall, smiling eyes, blue face tan, came a young man of some 26 years. John, the man said. What? said Captain John Black. <laughs> John, you old beggar you the man ran up and gripped his hand and slapped him on the back Wait, it's you of course <laughs> who'd you think it was Edward the captain appealed now to Lustig and Hingston holding the stranger's hand this is my brother Edward Ed meet my men Lustig Hingston this is my brother and they tugged at each other's hands and arms and then finally embraced. Ed, John, you old bum, you. You're looking fine, Ed, but... Ed, what is this? You haven't changed at all. You, you died, remember, when you were 26 and I was 19. That was so many years ago, and here you are. What goes on? What goes on here? Mom's waiting. Mom. Dad too. And Dad. The captain almost fell to earth of his hit upon his chest with a mighty weapon. And he walked stiffly and awkwardly out of coordination. He stuttered and whispered and talked only one or two words at a time. the old house on Old Knoll Avenue. The old house. Did you hear that? Lustig? Hingston? I know it's hard for you to believe. But alive. Real. I mean, don't I feel real? And the strong arm, the firm grip, the wife's smile, the light curling hair. Hingston was gone. He had seen his own house down the street and was running for it, and Lustig was grinning. Now you understand, sir, what happened to everybody on the ship. <laughs> they couldn't help themselves. Yes. Yes. When I open my eyes, what if this is all gone and you're still here? <laughs> Edward, you look fine. Come along. Lunch is waiting for you. I told Mom. Sir, I'll be with my grand folks if you want me. What? Oh, fine, fine, Lustig. Later then. Uh, you need support? I do. My, my knees are all funny and my stomach's loose. Well, there's the house. Remember it? <laughs> Remember it. I bet I could beat you to the front porch. And they ran. And the wind roared over Captain John Black's ears. The earth roared under his feet. And he saw the golden figure of Edward Black pull ahead of him in the amazing dream that was reality. He saw the house rush forward. The doors open. The screen swing back. Beat you, cried Edward, bounding up the steps. <laughs> 
I'm an old man, and you're still young, but then he always <laughs> did beat me, you remember? And in the doorway, Mom, pink and plump and bright, and behind her, Pepper Gray Dad, with his pipe in his hand. Mom, Dad! And he ran up the steps like a child to meet them. And it was a fine, long afternoon. They finished lunch and they sat in the living room and he told them all about his rocket and his being captain as they nodded and smiled upon him and mother just the same. Dad bit the end of a cigar and lighted it in his old fashion. Mom brought in some iced tea in the middle of the afternoon and then there was a big turkey dinner at night and time flowing on. And when the drumsticks were sucked clean and lay brittle on their plates, the captain leaned back in his chair and exhaled his deep contentment. And Dad poured him a glass of dry sherry. It was 7.30 in the evening. Night was in all the trees and coloring the sky. And the lamps were halos of dim light in the gentle house. From all the other houses down the street came sounds of music, pianos, laughter. Mom put a record on the Vitrola. And she and Captain John Black had a dance. She was wearing the same perfume he remembered from the summer when she and Dad had been killed in the train accident. But she was very real in his arms and they danced lightly to the music. I'll wake you in the morning and I'll be in my rocket in space and all this will be gone. Oh no. No, don't think that. We're here. Let's be happy. And the record ended with a circular hissing. You're tired, son. You and Ed go on upstairs. Your old bedroom is waiting for you. The old one. Brass bed and all. But I should report my men in. Well, why? Why, well, I don't know. No reason, I guess. I guess what is the difference? Good night, son. Good night, Mom. Good night, son. Sleep tight. Same to you, Pop. It's good to have you home. It's good to be home. He left the land of cigar smoke and perfume and books and gentle light and ascended the stairs, talking and talking with Edward. Edward pushed the door open and there was the yellow brass bed and the old semaphore banners from the college days and a very musty raccoon coat where he peddled with strange muted affection. It's too much. Like being in a thunder shower without an umbrella. I'm soaked to the skin. I'm numb. I'm tired. Yeah. A night's sleep between cool clean sheets would be good for you, bucko. So this is Mars. This is Mars. Edward, undressed and idle, leisurely moves, drawing a shirt off over his head, revealing golden shoulders and good muscular neck. The lights were out. They were into bed side by side as in the days, oh, how many decades ago. The captain lulled and was nourished by the night wind pushing the lace curtains out upon the dark room air. And among the trees upon the lawn, someone had cranked up a portable phonograph and was playing softly. I'll be loving you, always with a love that's true always. And the thought of Anna came to his mind. Is Anna here? Yeah, she's just out of town. She'll be here in the morning. I want to see Anna very much. Good night, Ed. Good night, John. And he lay peacefully, letting his thoughts flow. And for the first time, the stress of the day was moved aside. And all the excitement was calmed. He could think logically now. It had all been emotion. The band playing, the sight of familiar faces, the sick pounding of your heart. But now... How, he thought, how was all this made and why and for what purpose? And out of the goodness of some kind God, 
Was God then really that fine and thoughtful to his children? How and why and what for? And he thought of the various theories advanced in the first heat of the afternoon by Hingston, Lustig, and let all kinds of new theories drop lazy pebbles down through his mind as through a dark water now turning, throwing out dull flashes of white light. Mars. Earth, Mom, Dad, Edward, Mars, Martians. And who had lived here a thousand years ago on Mars? Martians? Or had this always been like this? Martians. He repeated the word quietly, inwardly, and he almost laughed out loud. He had the most ridiculous theory. All of a sudden, it gave him a kind of chilled feeling. It was really nothing to think of, of course. Highly improbable, silly. Forget it, ridiculous. But he thought, just suppose, just suppose now, that there were Martians living on Mars, and they saw the ship coming saw them inside the ship. Suppose now they wanted to destroy them as invaders, as unwanted ones, and they wanted to do it in a very clever way so that they would be taken off guard. Well, then what would be the best weapon that a Martian could use against Earthmen with atom weapons? Telepathy, hypnosis, memory and imagination. Suppose all these houses weren't real at all, this bed not real, but only figments of his own imagination, given substance by telepathy and hypnosis by Martian. Suppose these houses were really some other shape, a Martian shape, but by playing on his desires and wants, these Martians had made this seem like his old hometown, his old house, to lull him out of any suspicion. What better way to fool a man than by his own emotions? And suppose these two people in the next room asleep were not his mother and father at all, but two Martians. Incredibly brilliant with the ability to keep under this dreaming hypnosis all of the time. And that brass band today, what a clever plan it would be. First, full Lustig, then full Hingston, then gather a crowd around the rocket ship and wave, and all the men in the ship sing mothers, aunts, uncles, sweethearts, dead tin. 20 years ago naturally disregarded their orders. They would rush out and abandon the ship. What's more natural? What's more unsuspecting? What's more simple? A man doesn't ask many questions when his mother is suddenly brought back to life. And a brass band played and everybody was taken off to private homes and here we all are tonight in various houses various beds with no weapons to protect them and the rocket lies in the moonlight empty and wouldn't it be horrible and terrifying to discover that all of this part of some great clever plan by the Martians to divide and conquer and kill us sometime during the night perhaps his brother here on this bed will change form shift become one-eyed and green and yellow-toothed. It would be very simple for him just to turn over in bed and put a knife into his heart. And all those other houses down the street, a dozen other brothers or fathers, suddenly melting away and taking out knives, doing things to the unsuspecting, sleeping men of Earth. His hands were shaking under his covers. His body was cold, and suddenly it was not. 
theory. And suddenly he was very afraid. And he lifted himself in bed and listened. And the night was very quiet. And the music had stopped. And the wind had died. And his brother lay sleeping beside him. Very carefully, he lifted the sheets, rolled them back, and slipped from bed. And walking softly across the room, when his brother's voice said, Where are you going? What? I said, Where do you think you're going? For a drink of water. But you're not thirsty. Yes, I am. Captain John Black broke and ran across the room and screamed. He screamed twice and never reached the door. And in the morning, the brass band played a mournful dirge. From every house in the street came little solemn processions bearing long boxes. And along the sun-filled street, weeping and changing, came the grandmas and grandfathers and mothers and sisters and brothers walking to the churchyard and where there were holes dug freshly, new tombstones installed. Seventeen holes in all, and seventeen tombstones. Three of the tombstones said, Captain John Black, Albert Lustig, and Samuel Hingston. And the mayor made a sad little speech, his face, Sometimes looking like the mayor, sometimes looking like something else. Mother and Father Black were there with Brother Edward, and they cried, and their faces melting now from a familiar face into something else. Grandpa and Grandma Lustig were there, and the coffins were lowered. Somebody murmured about the unexpected and sudden deaths of 17 men during the night. And earth was shoveled in on the coffin tops. And after the funeral, the brass band slammed and banged into town. And the crowd stood around and waved and shouted as the rocket was torn to pieces, strewn up and blown to bits. (laughs) 